This is Intro to Buddhist Philosophy. And I really love this area because what it does is it offers up a framework to how we could think about life. And it's quite beautiful to have an array of frameworks. I remember I started getting into philosophy when I was 23 and I was living in San Diego, California. And uh, I had moved into a meditation center. And I started picking books from Osho, Alan Watts, uh, from, from Buddha, and just dissecting and analyzing all these different types of ways to think about life. And philosophy, actually, the root of it comes from uh, the Greek word philo, which is love, and sophos, which is wisdom. So this is actually uh, the love of, of wisdom, and I find that to be beautiful. Uh, and as much as I love philosophy on the intellectual level, it's really getting the knowledge into the, the, the brain. And then the beautiful part is actually practicing uh, what, what the teachings offer. That way you have the direct experience. And from there, that is really where the insight, you know, your personal insight and personal wisdom arise. And of course, there's also going to be these universal truths uh, to discover as well. And so this is really just a dipping of the toe into Buddhist philosophy because there are extensive studies uh, around this topic. And so I just wanted to offer substance on a intellectual level to all the things that we've been uh, expressing or I've been expressing uh, within the course and so let's get into it the four noble truths so these were the initial teachings of the Buddha and I want to express or disclose as well before we dive in is that I don't label myself as a Buddhist and the reason for that is because I think whenever we start to label ourselves with an identity that may be perceived as a religion it ends up creating this differentiation of you and I so you know if I say I'm Buddhist and then I meet someone who says they're Christian you know right off the bat it's like I see this person as red and I and they see me as blue and we're not seeing eye to eye just as humans and so that could create conflict even you know if there's mutual respect there's there's just gonna be this vibe of well you're not like me and so I tried to incorporate you know the teachings of Buddhism as a way to live life you know these are kind of just good practical and applicable uh, practices so this way you know if I do meet someone from a different belief or culture or religion it's not a I believe in this um, and it allows me to have kind of more unification uh, rather than confrontation so the four noble truths uh, there is suffering and so this was the initial insight that the Buddha had come to and the reason for that is uh, there's birth and so when we are born we actually come into the world crying <laughs> and so you know there probably are some babies that uh, come out laughing or smiling I don't know but for the most part we're all crying when we're born and so that is our initial phase of suffering and what that kind of leads into is that you know we're, we're entering into this journey and if everything is a cycle as you see at the end there's death and so in between all of that, there is sickness and, you know, I've had my own illnesses and it never feels good to be unhealthy. And so it causes us a lot of grief, a lot of pain. Um, and this just progresses as we get older. Right. And so death, you know, we're all afraid of it because it's quite a uncertain uh, topic. We don't know wh what's going to happen. Even though there's a lot of philosophers that say, you know, this may happen, we may get reincarnated. The truth is, is no one really knows. And so there's a tremendous amount of fear normally inside of our hearts and minds about that. And so we we tend to, you know, get scared. And it's it's okay to, to, to have that. But yet these are the fundamentals to the initial stage of suffering 
so the cause of suffering. And the Buddha explained that the people live in a sea of suffering because of ignorance and greed. And this weird ignorance, I don't want it to come across like dumb or stupid. It's simply not knowing, you know, not having the appropriate information or data, having those blind spots in our perspective. And all it really takes is, you know, that curiosity to go out and get educated, to listen more, to have more compassion. And greed, we covered in the 10 emotional hotspots. Um, so they are ignorant of the law of karma and are greedy for the wrong kind of pleasures. They do things that are harmful to their bodies and peace of mind. So what are some things that could be harmful for our body? Well, excessive eating or excessive drinking of alcohol to where we lose our you know, consciousness. Uh, and peace of mind you could you know say doing drugs or altering your your frameworks not that I'm against drugs but you know it could lead you into reducing uh, the peace of mind rather than you know gaining further insights also anger um, frustration you know these are very simple emotions but they deteriorate our peace of mind and our tranquility and so they can uh, cause us to not in, enjoy life. So then what's next? The end of suffering. To end suffering, one must cut off greed and ignorance. And for me, this is where the beauty of the noting mind comes into play. Because it, like before I, how I said, the noting mind is like a flashlight when you are in a dark room and you can eliminate the not knowing by placing the flashlight wherever you are in the room, you, you illuminate you know, with your awareness. And this begins to cut the energetic buildup of, of manifestation in the mind. And what I mean by that is, and this is you know, from my own direct experiences, when I was meditating and I was in such a subtle energetic body, I could feel the vibrations of thinking, you know, starting to generate. And as I felt that, I, I could observe it and stop the thinking before it became into overthinking. And so this is how you go to the root cause of a problem and you, you eradicate it, you know. And, and I guess the most important thing is let's say anger because i think that's what really destroys a lot of lives is just this anger you know we can spot anger and then become aware of it and begin to reduce it by our own awareness and by doing so one of the stages of enlightenment is actually no longer producing the the quality of anger you completely eradicate it from the mind and so this is one of the ways uh, to end suffering by using the noting mind. I'm sure there are many other ways, um, yet I've personally have experienced the, the benefits of using the noting mind. And so the path to the end of suffering, noble eightfold path. What is it? Well, it's on the next slide. So the noble eightfold path, path to end suffering, everyone can become self-realized and this is something i believe wholeheartedly and one thousand percent above and beyond and it's really the why to why i created this course because i believe that everyone has the capacity to become self-realized and what it requires is right view the right way to think about life is to see the world through the eyes of the Buddha with wisdom and compassion. And I want to take a step back as well when I use the word Buddha. It's the Buddha doesn't, you know, we, we have these statues of Buddha. And so we kind of have this depiction like this is what the Buddha looks like. In reality, you are the Buddha. In reality, I am the Buddha. And what I mean by that is that the Buddha is of qualities buddha nature you know the quality of compassion you can generate it i can generate it all these things that the buddha had discovered are really the human qualities that we have as individuals so moving on to the next one right thought 
We are what we think. Clear and kind thoughts build good and strong character. So right speech. By speaking kind and helpful words, we are respected and trusted by everyone. Number four, right conduct. No matter what we say, others know us from the way we behave. Before we criticize others, we should first see what we do ourselves. And so these can seem very basic, yet, you know, they're these simple reminders where what we put out is what we receive as well. What is above is below. So number five, right livelihood. This means choosing a job that does not hurt others. The Buddha said, do not earn your living by harming others. Do not seek happiness by making others unhappy. And so, you know, I, I understand that, you know, life can sometimes put us in these situations where we're struggling, you know, we're trying to figure out how to make money. And so that's where scheming can come into play. And the mean, mentality of win-lose arises, meaning like if I you know, come up with this scheme, yeah, this person will lose, but I'm going to win. And that really doesn't support abundance in the long run. In the short term, yeah, you may gain some money from whatever, you know, scheme you're, you're planning, but it doesn't help the other individual. And really, this journey of life is to bring value into your mind. And so, you know, you want to arrive to a place of win-win, like how do I create more value within my mind? How do I give more value to others so that they're winning, I'm winning? And that is really the comp uh, composition of abundance, abundance mindset. And so I understand, you know, there might be people who listen to this and they're really struggling. I've been there and, you know, you make the wrong choices. Yet, you know, it's important to try and do your best to get out of that situation when you are there, elevate yourself, ask yourself these questions, you know, how do I bring more value? Right effort. A worthwhile life means doing our best at all times and having good will towards others. This also means not wasting effort on things that harm ourselves or others. Uh, very important. I think that one's pretty straightforward. You know, when we don't make the right effort, we, we can cause more harm to ourselves. And I think this really comes down to, you know, self-sabotage, really. Uh, sometimes we, we get in our own way of uh, what we really want to accomplish or experience. Right mindfulness. This means being aware of our thoughts, words, and deeds. Number eight, right concentration. Focus on one thought or object at a time. That's, this is why I've distinguished the primary object with the secondary object so that we can build this concentration within our mind. And there's actually something called the paradox of choice. And what that talks about is how we now live in a world where we have tremendous amount of options. And I'll, I'll share a story. When I was in Japan, I wanted to go buy a toothbrush. And so I went to one of the mega super malls over there. And when I entered, you know, there were at least 20 different toothbrushes. And so each had different features. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, 20 minutes passed by and I was like, right, what, you know, head of the brush do I buy? And there were another 20 of those and how they had different features as well. And before I knew it, I was, you know, looking at toothbrushes for an hour. And I was like, my God, how can I not make a decision? And that comes down to us not having the right amount of concentration and also just having too many options. It makes, us it, makes it difficult for us to make a decision. <laughs> and so by doing this, we can be quiet and attain true peace of mind. And I mean, who doesn't want peace of mind? Moving on. The three universal truths. Nothing is lost in the universe. The first truth is that nothing is lost in the universe. Matter turns into energy. Energy turns into matter. A dead leaf turns into soil. A seed sprouts and becomes a new plant. Old solar systems disintegrate and turn into cosmic rays. We are born of our parents and our children are born of us. And this really comes back to the story of your life where I had said, you know, everything starts with a beginning, middle, and end. And that ending, end will also have a new beginning of the next experience. And so, you know, there is no uh, loss, simply transformation. 
it's a beautiful thing when you look at it. You cannot, you know, lose energy or make more of it. It's simply transforming. So that's why our attention is so important when we think about our mindsets. Everything changes. Hopefully by now you've been seeing that everything does change and there is no permanence. The second universal truth of the Buddha is that everything is continuously changing. Life is like a river flowing on and on, ever changing. And this is, uh, I like this analogy because we often think that, you know, we see the river changing. Yet, there is an expression where if you walk into a river, the river is not the same because it is changing. But the same applies to the individual that is standing in that river. They are not the same person prior to going into the river. They are not the same person coming out of the river. We too are always ever changing, ever evolving. You know, one of my teachers, he said, you know, each moment is fresh. There is nothing old in life. Each moment is new, especially when you get to see life in in that stillness, not still, I don't like that word, in that moment to moment expression. You know, you really get to see that, ah, yeah, this, this is a fresh and new experience. And again, another one. And so it's, it's quite beautiful, almost poetic. Sometimes it flows slowly and sometimes swiftly. And hopefully you've been seeing this with your uh, meditation, with your breath. I had expressed that each breath, each inhale, each exhale is completely new in itself. One may be quick, one may be slow, one may be kind of... Uh, with this frequency of vibration, you'll feel it in the body. It is smooth and gentle in some places, but later on snags and rocks crop up out of nowhere. As soon as we think we are safe, something unexpected happens. And I, I, I've definitely had this occur in my life where you think, you know, you're in this good groove and you're vibing life and you think you're on top of the world and then just a little thing around the corner comes about and uh, surprises you, you know. And so everything's always in flux. There's this ebb and flow to, to life. It's very dynamic. Law of cause and effect. The law of cause and effect is known as karma. I think we've, we've heard this word before. Karma underlines the importance of all individuals being responsible for their past and present actions. How can we test the karmic effect of our actions? The answer is summed up by looking at, one, the intention behind the action. And so just to take a step back, you know, I think it was about a month and a half in where I was at this point where I could see how all intention precedes action. If I wanted to speak the words that I'm speaking now, it requires an intention. If I want to move my body, how does it move? It needs the intention, my brain to tell this this physical thing to, to extend the arm, to bend, to open, to squeeze. There's always an intention preceding the action. Number two, effects of the action on oneself. And three, the effects on others. And I remember the uh, one of the teachers at the retreat, she was, a, she was a foreigner, I believe from the UK, if I remember correctly. And she, she devoted to living in the forest in Burma and to organize the 60 days of retreats. And she said, you know, something so simple. She was like, ask yourself this question. Is, is my thought, is my action coming from a place of wholeness or unwholesomeness? Uh, and to me, that was, that was beautiful because it's not so much like, is this good or bad? It really is, is like, is this going to enrich another person is this going to enrich my life and i think that really kind of brings up a beautiful vibration that we can all resonate with where we just want more happiness more joy let's move on to the next slide what is wisdom so buddhism teaches that wisdom should be developed with compassion the highest wisdom is seeing that in reality all phenomena are incomplete so non-permanent, impermanent, and do not constitute a fixed entity. And what that means is this really comes down to the how the phenomenon is not attached to the ego. 
It is not attached to a sense of self. You know, when you ask, when you sit into meditation and, and you look at how your breathing is occurring, is it you that's telling the, the mind to breathe? Or is there this consciousness within the mind that is communicating with the body to, to say, all right, hey, in order for us to survive mind and body, we need to do these functions because the mind doesn't want to die out. It wants to live. And so it needs to communicate with the body. And in the personal development world, you know, there's, there's this tremendous amount of you can control what's happening within you. And we can. That's where self-realization uh, comes into play. Yet we will see that when we meditate, we, we often don't have that ability yet. And we end up taking the experiences that we're having in our meditation, such as pain, as personal. That this is my pain. The pain that I am experiencing is mine. And the wisdom comes in where we no longer associate the emotion to our ego. This is really the beauty and where we get to harmonize the spiritual insights of non-ego and ego. When we get to see that pain is simply pain as it is. It is a phenomenon that is occurring within the mind. The same for happiness, you know, the same for joy is that we want to attach onto whatever it is that we're experiencing and claim it as ours. Yet if you can see that this is just what's happening in the moment, it doesn't belong to you. you it is flowing through you. And therein lies the wisdom that you can just appreciate. In this moment, I'm experiencing this as it is because the next moment will be something different. And if I can stay within this consciousness of moment to moment living, I will no longer be trapped by the past. I will no longer be worried about the future. And so that is true wisdom. And so here we go, the last kind of comment. True wisdom is not simply believing what we are told, but instead experiencing and understanding truth and reality. And the way to go about this is not to listen to my words or the words of another coach or teacher or, you know, religious uh, figure, because there's blind faith in that. When we simply listen to something, even if it sounds good, we have to verify. We have to put into practice the philosophy. We have to kind of be this wild scientist and discover, is this true? And that is why it is so beautiful to practice meditation on a daily basis because you get to examine your own mind. You know, it, you get to question what am I, what, the things that I'm saying in this course, are they true or is it bollocks, you know? And so wisdom requires an open and objective mind. The Buddha, the Buddhist path requires courage, patience, flexibility, and intelligence. And I find that to be a beautiful path. And so I hope uh, you've enjoyed this small intro into Buddhist philosophy. There are so many wonderful books out there that can allow you to dive very deep into uh, philosophy. Uh, yet again, my, my kind of uh, suggestion is to not get lost in all the intellectual information there's nothing more beautiful than having your own direct experience and your own practice. So this way you get to see all these concepts uh, for what it really is. And with that, that's the conclusion of uh, the intro to Buddhist philosophy. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to leave a comment below, please do so. And I'll see you in the next video.